Welcome to Uncage, the show that celebrates thought leadership from today's top business leaders. The program provides a voice to amazing executives from around the globe who are shaping the world of business today and mapping the path to the commerce of tomorrow. Today, we're speaking with Victor Cho. Hey, Victor, how are you? Matt, I'm doing good. Great to be here. It's great to have you. I, we're, I'm really honored to have you on the show. Victor is the former, now the former CEO of Evite. He has just stepped away, but uh, what an amazing company that that is and was. And, and so I'm excited to hear more about that journey that he's been on, but also to talk more about what he's working on now and this idea of the fourth stakeholder framework. But before we get into that, Victor, tell us a little bit about yourself and your career. Yeah, no, that, that such a pleasure to be here. Wish it was in person, but hopefully, you know, those are going to come sooner versus later. Next time, so next time for sure. That. So I'm a, uh, you know, I, if I put myself in a bucket, I would put myself in the bucket of you know, internet and tech entrepreneur and executive. I've been with the internet since its formation, uh, all the way back in the early '90s. I was at Microsoft, launched some of the first online websites in terms of selling products. So for God, that's been a long time now, since 1995, I've been involved online, uh, building new channels, reinventing business models, and have worked at a, just a range of companies from large scale like Microsoft to doing my own startup, to small companies, to middle-sized you know, middle companies like Intuit and kind of everything in between. Uh, I'd say if I had to pick a sweet spot within those companies that I really gravitate towards, it, it, uh, they're companies that have a, a networked business model to them. So some kind of what I call bi-directional connection between either consumers and other consumers or consumers and businesses. And every, pretty much everything I've done in the last, I don't know, 15 years have been in that vein. Yeah, one thing that really pops out and uh, that you talk about is your, your work in building online customer experiences that have very, very high net promoter scores, you know, 80 plus net promoter yeah. scores. How, how do you do that? Yeah, so uh, if uh, any of your listeners, are, I'll give two seconds of what Net Promoter is in case there's anyone that doesn't know what that is. Uh, Net Promoter, invented by a guy named Fred Reichheld. Uh, he and I actually did a tiny bit of work together while I was at Intuit. But it's, a, it's basically just a score to measure. I'm sure you guys have seen this on websites. You know, you hit it. You know, would, you be, would you recommend? How likely to recommend? So yeah, world-class companies can get that score up into the 80s. So that's the realm of Amazon, Apple, uh, you know, t t you know, two companies. I'm sure you guys all know. <laughs> uh, and no, I, you know, I really did get the religion while working at Intuit that the best customer experience is going to win at the end of the day. Yeah. And so, in terms of how to drive that engine, it is, you know, it's it's just a an embracing of customer centricity as yeah. the core of what your business does. It's kind of point number one. It's putting in all of the systems, processes, and measurement to now figure out, well, what is that score? What's causing people to not have a good experience? What's causing people to have a great experience? And really building that into the engine and just rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat. And that's why you know, it's not an instantaneous thing. It is a potentially a multi-year, multi-decade thing, depending yeah. on what your business is. Yeah, I think it's really what, what you said is purpose built, right? You really need to be focused on that from the get go and frame yeah. it around that, which is just really, really smart. Yeah. So, you know, Victor, obviously, you've had an incredible career, you're an advisor, you're a board member. And now you're working on this idea of the fourth stakeholder framework. Tell me more about how that works. Yeah, so this is something I've been passionate about Well, forever. I've always I have, I've used this line on, on my various speaking gigs forever, which is if you are blessed in our society to have control of some kind of scale lever, now that could be you're running a business, you're the you know, CEO or high level executive in a business, could be you're a founder of a business, could be you're in a position in government, wh whatever it is, right? People that control scale levers, you know, media companies, in my mind, have a responsibility to incorporate social good into how they manage that scale whatever it is. And so I've, you know, I've kind of beat that drum forever. And in businesses, all the businesses that I've run, I've tried to incorporate that in. So good example at Evite, uh, you know, I ran that for seven years. We did, we integrated donations directly into the flow uh, and ended up raising, and we're probably at like $30 million raised for nonprofits as a result of that. 
And that wasn't a make money tactic. That was just a, hey, this is, you know, customers are trying to bring parties, you know, throw parties and raise money. Let's make that easier for them. And let's connect it to right. all these great sources. So uh, the fourth stakeholder at a high level is, you know, if you think of how businesses have operated in the past, they tended to balance three, the shareholder, customer, where you know, people have gotten new religion to a large degree because of net promoter and the push there, and employee, right? Those tend to be the three that people think about. The fourth one is, no, 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 you, you have a responsibility to balance societal impacts as well. And you know, the good news is, on one hand, there's a bunch of great energy coming into this space across a number of different vectors, whether it's corporate responsibility, you know, there's a, an effort called CSR, um, there's another one called ESG, you know, environment, social responsibility, governance. There's a, there's a whole wave of benefits corporations, which are basically built around doing social good. So there's, I'm optimistic that there's a lot of great energy. I'm also pessimistic in that that's still the my, tiny percentage of how companies operate, right? It's not deeply ingrained in companies' DNA to say, no, no, I, I do have a social responsibility as one of my four stakeholders. So that's I'm going to go out and beat that drum, I think, a lot louder. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And I, you know, I would say that we hear a lot of discussion right now about a lot of these um, CSR, you know, initiatives, right, uh, that are happening. And certainly companies are starting to wake up to the need. I would say probably there's been a bit of a, a shift over the last couple of years for sure. Tell us a little bit about where you're seeing where we are right now in some of this. I mean, I, I'd just be be curious. Are we are we just getting going? Or are there some great examples? What are you seeing? Yeah, and that's a, I'm, a, I'm a huge framework guy. And I have a website where I put all my frameworks on. <laughs> so I've got a framework for this as well. So yeah, the, the way I split the world is that there are these buckets of companies that their, their reason to exist is to do good. Right? And, and they frame themselves, they, re, they re, you know, reincorporate or incorporate as things like benefits corporations or B corporations or their nonprofits. Um, or, you know, I would I would put Tesla in this bucket as well. Like, you know, whatever you say about Elon Musk, like the, the core business that Tesla is was built on a purpose, right, to reduce carbon footprint. So like that's a business, the better it does in general, the better the world gets. Right. So those feel great about those businesses. Again, early stage. It's a small percentage of the total businesses in the world. But there's good things happening, right? Cap capital support for those businesses continues to grow. There's a, you know, probably like 30 private equity firms, right? That are now in support of benefits corporations. So, so that that train is moving and moving um, great. But now you've got the let's call it you know the 98 percent of the rest of the world, which are just businesses trying to do business. Uh, and there, what's happened? What's tend to tend, tends to happen is that they're they're getting religion around certain things, particularly environment is a big one diversity is a big one and so those are good also good trains that are moving what's lacking and where i want to spend a lot of my time is businesses are horrible at understanding what is the footprint of impact i call the second order footprint second order effect of their business right so especially in, in this internet world and you're seeing it with you know, google and apple and facebook right more and more scale is going to accrete to a smaller number of companies and the ecosystem footprint in the society of those businesses, it gets be, gets out of control, right? You know, the, these companies don't understand. Nobody, it's too complex, right? The the spillover footprint of all the social media companies. I mean, that's in the press, right? In a very aggressive way now. So that's a great example, right? That that industry as a whole had no idea of the downstream psychological impacts of the products, right? And now the second order effects of that are like, holy crap! What do we do about it? We're not doing yeah, it. Now. I mean, I think the example that always hit me was, and, and I, I, I don't. I, this is certainly not a, not to tar and feather this company because I actually think they're doing many good things right now. But anybody who has seen the growth of Amazon over the last decade, and now uh, gets greeted during the holiday season with just mountains of boxes on every street <laughs> corner. Yeah. Really, it hits me. I'm always wondering, like, this can't be good. Like, this, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, having all this, all these cardboard boxes being made and pressed yeah. and pushed out just can't be good. And so I, I don't know, you know, what what they're doing on that particular point, but. You're absolutely right. Thinking through these challenges is going to be absolutely critical. Yeah. And they're, they're just there. The second order effects are, are 
really hard for businesses to grapple with because a lot of times it's imperfect data and there's not a direct causal link, right? You know, fa Facebook can legitimately stand, put, it, put up its hands and say, oh yeah, yeah there, maybe there is an increase in teen suicide, which there is. Maybe there is an increase in teen depression, which there is. But they can always step back and say, well, there's, there's Apple, right? Maybe that's the cell phone. Maybe that's TikTok. Maybe that's Snapchat. Like maybe we're just a part of it. So because you have the broken causal link, you have an easy way for companies to wave their hands. It's almost like tragedy of the commons, if you're familiar with that. It's like, oh no, no, no we're kind of, we're, you know, we're contributing, but not our problem. And that can't be the operating model as we move forward because these systems again are, are so big and the footprint impact is so high we need we need the executives to come forward and say you know i was heartened because i was i was actually uh speaking to a chief sustainability officer uh from europe the other day and they were highlighting that what they're seeing now is whenever there's a kind of a, a request uh from a procurement team in a, a big company this topic is listed. There's a real pressure, at least in Europe, to make sure that the vendor has a good story when it comes to being carbon neutral, being good stewards, etc. And I mean, I don't know how far that will go, but certainly that seems to be at least a small step forward uh, going forward. I'm not sure if that kind of parlays into anything over here in the U.S., but... <laughs> Right. No, no, I would say that at a meta level, I feel like Europe is more evolved in terms of its social responsibility, just DNA. It's, I, I feel like it's, it's a little bit ahead of the game in terms of people naturally thinking about those things. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing that uh, I know that a lot of people are wrestling with is literally just the measurement of all of this stuff yeah. and, and trying to get kind of a common list of measures. Is, is that something that is connected to the framework that you're working on? No, my, in my mind, measurement is core, right? If, you know, in, in, the, in the very simple view, I feel like if you're the CEO or the bo a board member of a company with some significant scale impact, you have a pretty simple process to run, which is like, yeah. you know, identify what your first order business effects are, right? Your first order is just what is the business doing? <laughs> is there anything good or bad, right, that's happening there? And are you tracking it? Most companies do that, right? Because that's the nature of their business. The, the big addition I have is, okay, now figure out, do you have any bad second order effects? Wow. Right? And maybe you're not the only cause, but you are on, you are responsible for that spillover impact. And now, do you have a measurement system, even imperfect as it might be, right, to try to go figure it out? And do you have a process to then go fix it? I mean, in, in some ways, it's actually very similar to Net Promoter, right? The, the Net Promoter yeah. concept is figure out what's causing pain for the customer, right? Yeah. Measure it with a simple measure, and then put an improvement process. So this, in yeah. my mind, is similar. Like, is this business creating pain in the society? measure it, put an improvement process. Yeah, I like that. I'm a big believer of, of simplifying measurement down to the core variable that essentially yeah. is, is the one that kind of leads to everything. So that's a, I love the way you're thinking about that, Victor. So tell me, uh, you know, the last couple of years have been an interesting moment, clearly a big, big moment for you as you've been transitioning into a new space in, in your life um, out of Evite. But also, obviously, the world's been going through uh, a difficult time with the pandemic. And just be curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, learnings from that moment, as well as uh, maybe some opportunities, challenges, um, how, how that's impacted you. God, yeah, the, yeah, the, we could fill hours, right, with the, with the pandemic. Yeah. It's, you know, at, at the macro level, some things that jump out at me. One, I am blown away by how fast behaviors configured and reconfigured across the society, right? If you think about across almost every industry, you know, help at home gym, whatever it is, you know, of course, parties went way down and now they're coming back, which is great. But across, you know, education across every function, right? This is the entire world yeah. had to change its behavior and it did so, I don't want to say painlessly, but I, I was amazed at how fluid it was and how quickly life adjusted across the entire planet. So that, that makes me optimistic. I'm generally an optimistic guy too. You'll, you'll find that. Yeah. Um, the other thing, uh, the other thing that makes me super optimistic, I'll take it to a tiny dark place is I, don't ask me why, but I have a list of like, what are the five existential risks to humanity that I think are, that we should be worrying about. Um, and one of them pre pandemic was a global pandemic, right? That basically takes us back into the stone age. 
I am much less worried. This might sound weird. I am much less worried about that now because of the resilience that we just saw. Like the, yeah, in some ways we got lucky, right? We dodged despite the millions of fatalities. Like this was not as deadly a virus as it could have been. And we have right. clearly shown that the society, if something like that were to come through, you know, if, if something like, you know, the Spanish flu were to come through, you know, or, you know, two to three X times mortality, right? The world can adjust. Like people are, you know, our, our supply chains can still run. We, we have yeah. all the tools now and we've gone through the dry run, which makes me even more bullish, right? Which is like, okay, okay. This was kind of the dry run in some ways. Uh, I think we're, we're much better prepared as a society to deal with another pandemic. So that I feel good about. Yeah, good. that's that's a really good and I, as you said, you're an optimist, optimistic learning there for sure. I do think that sometimes we we don't reflect on that enough because it's an incredible human achievement. What was what, what happened with yes. the, you know the creation of multiple vaccines in a record breaking time yeah. and rolled out globally. It's I, it just anybody who's ever worked in pharma or in the medical industry, I do hope that we can at some point can reflect on how how amazing that has been. I mean, it's yeah. been yes. unbelievable, unbelievable. Yes. So uh, I, I completely agree with you. I, so I so, totally agree with that. <laughs> Yeah. So listen, Victor, I'm, I'm excited about what you're what you're rolling out. And I mean, we're in this big, brave new world of 2022. Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing this year and, and what your plans are. Uh, do you, from a business perspective, personal perspective, both? Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of like the landscape. I mean, certainly you're, you're touching, I would say, on a lot of digital industries, yeah. transformational space. What, what do you think the priorities are for 2022? Yeah, at the at the business level, I think the biggest paintbrush that I would uh, put on canvas is we still haven't digested the impact of pandemic. Like I, I, a lot of people are making the misassumption or the false assumption that like okay, well, one, yeah, once we open the world back up and everything comes back to normal instantaneously, mm. and that's not the case. We've had two two full years <laughs> of an entire world being locked down. Behaviors being reconstructed, trillions of dollars, right, flowing in. Yeah, the system. it is going to take multiple years for that to work through, and that's going to have a bunch of unforeseen shocks and changes. Whether it's inflation or supply chain issues or just a, you know Peloton making its shift from oh crap, now we were on the right side of the macro wave, now we're on the wrong side of the macro wave. Like that, that in the same way it rippled through over the last two years and changed, it's going to have to ripple through again and re, you know basically reset to some new normal which is not the pre-pandemic normal which is the other right. i think big change people anyone who's assuming it just gets back to the way it was is not the case right we, we right. settle into a completely new environment so that's i think that's the biggest business challenge is for leaders to recognize that hump is still coming <laughs> it's not it's not ending overnight uh, yeah no i think it's a really good point it's it's something that i think when we kind of go into a bit of a romanticized mindset we get excited about things almost going into some some halcyon vision that we have of the past but the reality is that it's not going to be that that way yeah. and we've already seen seen it with employees where their bosses are saying okay so the office is open <laughs> and, yeah. and, and 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 the boss is sitting there by themselves <laughs> as, as, yeah. as the employees are like yeah we're we're good we're good <laughs> so i think we'll have a, a lot of different things happening there and yeah. certainly things like the supply chain seem to be getting reworked and also really coming back to what you're working on which is this discussion about this, the fourth stakeholder and, and really kind of putting the sustainability focus on everything that we do is just going to become more and more important going forward for sure. Victor, it's been great talking to you today. Um, if yeah. someone wanted to reach you, where can they find you? Oh, uh, sure. So I've got a personal website, which has all my contact digits, just victorcho.com. But uh, short answers, yeah, uh, you can email me at me at 
victorcho.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we've been speaking with Victor Cho, the former CEO of Evite. Uh, He's recently left. He's working on a lot of very, very cool stuff. He's an advisor, a board member, and he has a deep passion for building online customer experiences, but maybe even a deeper passion for what he's coining the fourth stakeholder framework. And so I'm excited to hear more about how that develops this year, Victor. And thank you so much for being on Uncaged. Awesome. My pleasure, Matt. This has been great. Cheers. Talk soon. 